Welcome to the biology section of our practice MCAT questions. In this video, we're going to be going through questions 141 to 145. So first I'll show you guys a question so that you can pause the video and attempt them on your own. On your own. Here's question 141, 142, 143, 144, and 145. Now let's go through the questions together. In question 141, we were asked which of the following statements about endocrine glands is true. We are talking about endocrine glands. So endocrine glands, the word endocrine means that this is something, a signaling molecule, which has been released into the bloodstream. So this is a long distance signaling. Some sub subset of cells, they secrete something into the bloodstream and then it goes and acts on its receptors on the target cells. And this is in contrast to something being autocrine, which is when a signaling cell releases signaling molecules that come and act upon that same cell. And then another type we have is paracrine signaling, which is when you impact other cells around you. So the receptors or the target cells are the cells that are in the close environment to the, to the signaling cell. But endocrine cells, those are released into the bloodstream and they are much more longer distance. So option A, oh, by the way, we're looking for something which is true. Option A is saying they are ductless. This is something which is true. They don't have ducts. They don't release things from ducts into like the surrounding environment. And then it's taken up by the target cell. They release things directly into the bloodstream. Option B is saying they secrete autocrine compounds. No, autocrine and paracrine. That's a different type of signaling. We're talking about endocrine. Option C is saying very few, if any, of the hormones of the endocrine glands are steroid based. This is false because many endocrine hormones are steroid based. And finally, option D is saying all endocrine glands are derived from endoderm. The fact that it says all is not correct. Some are derived from the mesoderm. So therefore, the true statement would be option A. In question 142, it says certain small isolated populations have a higher rate of particular genetic diseases that are otherwise very rare. These diseases are more common in these populations due to blank. So we see that some small isolated populations have a higher rate of genetic diseases that are otherwise very rare. Why are they more common? So what is the reasoning for that? The fact that this is otherwise very rare, and we're talking about genetic diseases, we're also talking about small isolated populations, this should get you thinking what you learned in genetics about, about having different alleles for any gene that we're talking about. In this case, we're talking about a gene for a disease. Having different alleles, you can have a dominant allele or a recessive allele. There are also, of course, other patterns, but let's talk about the basic one which is where we have a dominant allele and a recessive. And since we're saying that these diseases are otherwise very rare, that would lead us to thinking that, okay, this is due to having two copies of the recessive type allele. Otherwise you don't have this disease, but if you have both, then you do have the disease. If you have just one of the recessive copy, then you're a carrier and it's possible that an offspring might have the disease. So that's how you don't really, that's why you don't see the disease that often in a much larger population. Some people might be carriers, but the likelihood that you're going to be a homozygous recessive carrier, you're, like you're going to be an offspring that has homo homozygous recessive genotype is much rarer in larger populations, but then in smaller populations, that likelihood can increase specifically if we have something called inbreeding. So B would be the strongest answer. If we have inbreeding, we have breeding of two parents that are closely related they therefore have a similar genetic makeup and then when they have offspring there's a higher chance of increasing the the prevalence or the yeah the prevalence of the recessive allele in that population as a whole so when we see inbreeding and when we see it in a small population we see that the recessive alleles they begin to be more apparent in the population whereas their percentage is much smaller in a larger population. So inbreeding is the most likely reason for that. Option A is saying genetic drift of those populations. Genetic drift is the change in the relative 
prevalence relative abundance of different alleles in a population due to chance events, events that lead to some parents that have a certain type of allele being able to, you know, reproduce and then pass on those alleles to their offspring, and then the offspring also being able to reproduce and pass on those alleles. So that's just like normal chance events that changes the abundance of different alleles in a population, and it does have higher effect if we're talking about a small population versus a large, but this, you know, can go many different ways. It doesn't specifically go to increasing the abundance of the recessive allele, whereas inbreeding definitely does. Option C is seeing a higher percentage of males and thus higher incidence of sex-linked conditions. There's no real evidence of that. Usually populations are 50-50, male and female, and it's not like a thing that we see in smaller populations that we have more males. This is just referring to you know X-linked recessive alleles. Those, yeah, sure, we see them more often in males than in females, but there's no clear observable thing that we see when we have a small population that we have more males. It doesn't happen. So therefore, C is incorrect. And then finally, D, bottleneck effect in these populations. First of all, there isn't like enough evidence saying that this isolated population resulted from a bottleneck. So a bottleneck would be like if we had a larger population, some event led to the population splitting up and then we have this smaller subset of it. The bottleneck is that whatever alleles this subset of the population has, when they start creating a bigger population and when they grow their small population into a bigger one, it's going to represent those alleles from the founders, right? But that, just like genetic drift, it can go like for in many directions and it doesn't specifically choose for recessive alleles. Therefore, B would be the best answer for talking about genetic diseases that are otherwise rare, now becoming more prevalent in a isolated small population. In question 143, we're asked, which of the following is false? regarding the electron transport chain. We're talking about the electron transport chain, which of these is false? So this is in the mitochondria. Remember, along the inner mitochondrial membrane, we have a few different enzymes, and what they do is they take, well, they transfer electrons in a chain, and then they take protons, so hydrogen ions, and pump them into this intermembrane space between the inner and the outer mitochondrial membrane, and then you have this gradient of protons that comes back in through the ATP synthase, which then is able to use that energy from the gradient to turn ADP into ATP. So that's the electron transport chain. Option A is saying that a proton gradient allows for generation of ATP. This is correct. This is one of the key things, generating that proton gradient and then using the energy from it to produce ATP. That's what the electron transport chain is for. Option B is saying in the last step of the chain, oxygen act, accepts a pair of electrons to form water, yes. So we do have these enzymes that are transferring electrons between each other, and then the final carrier or acceptor of those electrons is oxygen, so it takes it, it gets reduced, and then also that hydrogen, the hydrogens that are coming back in can go and react with this oxygen and form water. That is correct. Option C is saying core proteins of the chain are housed on the inner mitochondrial membrane. This is correct as well. They're on the inner membrane, and they pump ions into the membrane space between the inner and the outer membrane. And finally, D is saying NADH is a byproduct of the electron transport chain. And because of the H, that is a false statement, therefore D is our correct answer. NADH is not a byproduct. From other reactions in the cell, like glycolysis or the Krebs cycle, we get NADH formed, but then that NADH is used to power the electron transport chain. We take the NADH and then enzymes in the electron transport chain will take the protons from the NADH and then use those to pump protons into the intermembrane space. So NADH loses its hydrogens. So NADH is an electron carrier. It loses those electrons. This is where we get those electrons from the electron transport chain as well as from FADH2. And then a byproduct you could say is NAD+, plus, but not NADH. Therefore, option D is a false statement and it's the correct answer. In question 144, we're asked, which of the following is correct regarding prions? So which one is correct? So prions are these proteins that are kind of infectious and they're misfolded. And what they can do if they get into an organism is start affecting other proteins in that organism that they come into contact with. 
and causing them to misfold. So if you have something which is calling, causing misfolding of you know, important proteins in a cell that it really needs, then those functions that the proteins carry out cannot happen and then this will eventually lead to the cell not being able to properly function and die. So these are prions are molecules which can be the cause of many different diseases in animals and they affect humans too in a lot of neurodegenerative diseases such as Critzfield Jakob disease. So option A is saying they're entirely composed of proteins. Yes, they are protein molecules which cause other proteins to misfold. B is saying they are not involved in diseases in humans. That's incorrect. They are involved they are involved in human diseases as well as for other animals. Option C is saying they describe viral proteins capable of introducing viral DNA into host DNA. No, they don't do this. They're not like viruses. They don't introduce viral DNA into host DNA. They just cause misfolding of other proteins that they come into contact with. And option D is saying they are proteins which may bind to other proteins and result in the protein's degradation. It's not necessarily degradation. They cause misfolding of the protein. And so these misfolded proteins can clump up and still be around in the cell. And then some other mechanism can come and see that this is incorrect and that can lead to degradation. But their specific mechanism isn't causing proteins to be degraded. It's more so causing them to be misfolded and therefore non-functional. So A is the correct answer. Question 145 is asking us which of the following correctly assigns the ascending order of blood pressure in the given blood vessels. So it's increasing, meaning the one on the right has the highest pressure. So we want to have ascending order of blood pressure in these blood vessels that were given. So the one that would be the highest blood pressure would definitely be the aorta. So we can rule out C and D because C said the vena cava had the highest blood pressure and in D said the veins have the highest blood pressure, that would be incorrect. The highest pressure is first you have the left ventricle, right? You have that contracting, which pushes blood very strongly into the aorta. So that's where you have the highest pressure in the aorta. And it goes through other arteries, then arterioles, then into capillaries. Then we get into venules and then larger veins. And then the veins which bring the blood back from the systemic system into the right atrium would be the vena cava, the superior and the inferior ones. And we have the highest pressure at the beginning when it's pumped from the blood, and then the lowest when it's coming back towards the blood. So option A is saying vena cava have the lowest blood, which is true because they're bringing it right back to the right atrium, so they would have the lowest. And then after that, it says arterioles. But then option A is implying that large veins have higher blood pressure than arterioles. That would be incorrect. The aorta part is right, but they switched that order. And therefore we can remove A and B is our correct answer. Vena cava have the lowest blood pressure. Other veins leading into them have slightly higher blood pressure, but it's still lower than arterioles. And then the aorta leading right out from the heart, from the left ventricle is the highest blood pressure. That's it for the questions in this video. If you enjoyed what you saw, make sure to check out our course. The link is right here as well as in the description below. And in that course, we go through a lot more questions just like this and explain all the different answer options to you. We also have lecture videos on all the subjects that are gonna be covered on the MCAT. Other than that, make sure to subscribe here to this channel to stay up to date with the videos that we post here. And that's it for this video. I'll see you guys.